Good Sunday morning to you. What a grand and glorious day it is to praise the Lord. If you would, stand to your feet, and let's get to doing that. I will enter his gates with thanksgiving in my heart. I will enter his courts with praise. I will say this is the day that the Lord has made. I will rejoice for he has made me glad. I will enter his court with thanksgiving in my heart. I will enter his courts with praise. I will say this is the day that the Lord has made. I will rejoice for he has made me glad. For he has made me glad. Whoa, he has made me glad. And I will rejoice for he has made me glad. For he has made me glad. Whoa, he has made me glad. And I will rejoice for he has made me glad. I will enter his courts with thanksgiving in my heart. I will enter his courts with praise. And I will say this is the day that the Lord has made. I will rejoice for he has made me glad. For he has made me glad. For he has made me glad. And I will rejoice for he has made me glad. He has made me glad. Oh, he has made me glad. And I will rejoice for he has made me glad. This is a faith in love 
see in the house of the Lord this morning. Uh, for those of you in service, for those of us joining us online, I want to thank you so much for being here. Uh, but the, we have a special way of greeting you. Uh, if this is your first time, we'd ask that you remain seated. Members, regular attenders, let's get up from where we are and greet those that are new. Ready, set, go. Amen and amen. You may please return to your seats and remain standing. Please return to your seats and remain standing. If you are new or if you have a prayer request, there's a welcome card in the seat back in front of you. We'd ask that you fill that out at the end of the service. We'd love the opportunity to meet you, greet you, put a free gift in your hand. Today, I have Linda McMillan coming up, and she's going to be doing today's scripture reading. And this is wrong way, Linda. She's running from me already. So go ahead, let's go ahead and go to those slides. Good morning. Today's reading is from 2 Thessalonians 2, verses 1 through 12. Now we request, request you, brethren, with regard to the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ and our gathering together to him that you would not be quickly shaken from your composure or be disturbed either by a spirit or a message or a letter as it is from, as if from us to the effect that the day of our Lord has come. 
Let no one in any way deceive you, for it will not come unless the apostasy comes first. <clears throat> and the man of lawlessness is revealed and the son of destruction, who opposes and exalts himself above every so-called God or object of worship, so that he takes his seat in the temple of God, displaying himself to, as being God. Do you not remember that while I was with you, I was telling you these things, and you know what restrains him now, so that his, in his time he will be revealed. For the mystery of the lawlessness is already at work. Only he who now restrains will do so until he is taken out of the way. Then the lawless one will be revealed, whom the Lord will slay with his breath of his mouth and bring to an end by the appearance of his coming. That is... The one who is coming is in accord with the activity of Satan, with all power and signs and false wonders, and with all of the deception of wickedness for those who perish, because they did not receive the love of the truth so as to be saved. For this reason, God will send upon them a deluding influence so that they will believe what is false, in order that they, will, that they all may be judged who did not believe the truth, but took pleasure in wickedness. Let's pray. Father God, we just come to you right now, Father, and we just thank you, Father. We thank you for the truth, Father. And Father, I just pray, Father, in these days to come, Father, that you just uh, give us eyes to see, Father, and not be blinded by the world, Father, to stay focused on you, Father. Father, I pray, Father, that you just give us your eyes, Father. And conviction and courage, Father, to continue to share the gospel, Father. To stand in the gap, Father. To share your love with the lost, Father. And Father, we thank you and we praise you. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Please remain standing. Hallelujah, hallelujah. 
and he is. Praise the Lord. So good to see you today. Glad you're here. Great way to start our year last week with communion service and what a time just together and worship the Lord together there. So uh, setting off on the right foot, second Sunday of the year. Glad you're here to worship with us today. We start a new series today called Time's Running Out. And I'm preaching this series specifically for one reason. Time's running out. And we need to be aware, we need to be cognizant of what is going on in the world around us. I had the opportunity to celebrate Christmas yesterday, so that's a little late. Well, we could finally get our crew together. And uh, we're talking about the birth of the Lord Jesus Christ in our time together and the fact that there were so many promises that talked about the Lord's first coming. But for every one of those, Scripture mentioned in the Old Testament as well as the New Testament, eight more for one of the Lord's second coming. So pretty simply put, if those first passages were true about the Lord, you can count on those second passages of his second advent coming true as well. And I believe the Bible has a lot to say about it. I believe that uh, most of us are aware that these are crisis days that we're living in, and they're not accidental days. The Bible talks about as we get clear, uh, closer to the return of the Lord Jesus Christ, then the more chaotic the days would become, more critical the days would become. So I think it's important we realize that these really are those days. Uh, this is a, uh, I told them this morning, this is a, I feel like we're in the Saturday evening of the age, that the sky is dark with clouds of approaching judgment. Uh, one thing that people don't understand, that there's this one element that's been left out of most people's gospel message when they share it. The good news is the good news because we're so entrenched in bad news. The bad news is that we are sinners. The bad news, we're separated from God. The bad news is that because of that condition of rebelling against God, the uh, Bible calls us enemies with God, and we're, in, we're under condemnation of God, and there's nothing we have to look forward to but judgment. But in comes Jesus, hallelujah, and now we can look forward to deliverance. Jesus said, I didn't come into the world to condemn it. Why? It was already condemned. He said, but I came to, to set you free. And so as we look at these, these, the end times, there's a lot of judgment that's being poured out upon the planet. We talk about uh, the apocalypse. And uh, I know people today, when I say apocalypse, some of you think zombies. Uh, the apocalypse is not zombies. <laughs> the apocalypse is Jesus. And it literally means the, the re revealing, the revelation. That's what the new book of Revelation is, the apocalypse book. And it's the unveiling, the revelation of Jesus Christ. But with that comes judgments. And there's that time of seven years we talk about of judgment. So as we talk about this particular series, I'll refer to some of those things. And I'm, I want to show a few charts through this particular, uh, not maybe as many as we've done in some times past. But I think just about everybody I've talked to realizes that something's going on in the world and they're not quite sure what it is. Whether the people who know the Lord or don't know the Lord, it seems, you know, the, they're kind of looking at each other like, hey, what is going on? What, you know, this, this is, the world's gone nuts. People lost their minds. Well, that's the way it's going to be. The closer we get to Jesus' return, it's going to get more and more like that. Uh, that passage that it was Linda that read, I think, this morning, right, uh, from 2 Thessalonians, if you have your Bible, why don't you just open up back to that because that's our, our, our study today uh, in Scripture as we talk about the end times where the Apostle Paul is telling the Thessalonians who some have told them, hey, God, Jesus came and you all missed it. Paul said, you didn't miss it, all right? He hadn't come back yet. And he's giving them some insight and instruction on what has to happen first. And there's about five stages when you look at 2 Thessalonians chapter 2 that are mentioned in that passage where there's stages or scenes that are talked about in, in that passage. The first thing he talks about is a coming apostasy. Now, the apostasy, the whole book of Jude is given to that. Much of the book of 2 Peter deals with the apostasy. And it's called the falling away. Now, it's not, it's not like some people think. They think it's Christians who just quit being Christians. These are supposed believers. These are people who have a, well, Peter talked about this, where they have a form of godliness, but they deny the power of it. They, they really don't live for the Lord. But they talk it real good, but they don't walk it at all. And there's a lot of pretense that goes on. God's going to separate that out in these end times, and he's going to deal with it. But he talks about, hey, before Jesus comes, this, this great falling away is going to come. And it's, it's going to affect, and, you know, churches are going to get smaller. Christian groups are going to get smaller. It's just, you know, it's just going to happen in the end, end times. And then he said, the second thing that's going to have to happen before Christ comes says there's going to be the rapture. You say, well, that doesn't say rapture in that verse. It, it uses it this, this way in that one particular verse when he talks about the restrainer. He says, he who now lets will let. It may say it that way in your, in your, in your uh, version of the Bible. He who lets what? 
He who lets things, you know, go on right now the way they go on is letting them go on, but he also is a restrainer. He that restrains will be taken out of the way. Now, who is he that restrains in the world today that restrains this great evil he's talking about of the Antichrist, this massive delusion and deception that takes place? He said that there was really only one. That's the Holy Spirit. And his operation in the world today is mostly through the church and through believers, right? He, yes, he's omnipresent. He's everywhere. Somebody said, well, this is when the whole, God, God takes the Holy Spirit away. Now, the Holy Spirit's omnipresent. It's the work of the Holy Spirit now that's restrained. <clears throat> so this restraining element that the Holy Spirit uses is who? It's us. It's the church. Jesus said, you're the light of the world. You're the salt of the earth. So the effect that Christians are having in the world is one of the things that's keeping all this in check as the Holy Spirit works through us, all right? But he's saying it's going to get worse when that is gone. He's going to be taken out of the way. That's, I believe, the reference to the blessed hope that the Scripture talks about, and we'll talk about that next Sunday. We'll get ahead of ourselves. Let's get it in order. So we talk about a little bit about the Antichrist today, and then he says, the, the who lets will, will be taken out of the way in verse 3. And after that, he says, and then the man of sin will be revealed. This, the Antichrist is going to become obvious to the world. That's, that's pretty much the topic of verses 3 and 4 and 8 and 9 and on to the end of those verses we read is that this man of sin, this Antichrist who opposes everything that's God and calls himself God and exalts himself above everything that's called God. Literally, the, uh, the Old Testament refers to it as the abomination of desolation. Revelation talks about it where the Antichrist who makes his seven-year peace treaty during the tribulation with Israel and the, their enemies, and then he comes in and three and a half years into it, he walks into the temple and calls himself God and he breaks the treaty with, with them. Uh, that's called the Great Tribulation. <coughs> Excuse me. The Tribulation is about seven years long. This is in the middle, and that's when time of Jacob's trouble talk starts. Following that, point five, is the Lord comes. And when he shows up, <coughs> excuse me, things are radically changed. I don't know if you're having trouble with cedar pollen this week. I'm drinking every bit I can. I got, we got somebody, praise God, left an extra up here today. You've been informed that when I take a drink, you're supposed to do what? Say amen. <laughs> we'll make it easy. So let me share with you this end time chart. But, you know, for those who are real students of eschatology, end times, and prophecy, don't freak out. This chart is not complete. It just kind of talks about what's happening in this passage, all right? And so it specifically points to where we're at today. So it starts off over here where it says past ages, and you see the arrow coming down, arrow coming down. That's Jesus when he comes. He's born. That's Christmas, all right? He happens, and then his life, his message, he's crucified, and then he's raised up the third day in the resurrection back to the Father's house. That begins this time we just call the church age. That's where we are right now, where the Holy Spirit is working in the church and through believers to share the gospel with as many people as possible that were out there you know, following their great commandment to love people, love God, and the great commission to reach the lost and to reach the world. Soon coming, somewhere along the lines of Antichrist and all the end of this particular time, we're going to see the rapture of the church, that restrainer. He's going to be taken out of the way, and we're going to re be received up into glory, into the Father's house. There's some stuff up there that's going to take place, and we'll talk about the Bema seat and on that. But meanwhile, back on planet Earth at the ranch, Antichrist makes his big show. He appears. So many believe on him. He declares himself at the middle of the tribulation to be God. He takes his seat in the temple. And so that's a seven-year period. At the end of that seven years of just hell on earth, literally, then comes the Lord Jesus coming with the saints in glory, coming with the angels in glory. And this passage says he destroys the Antichrist with the brightness of his coming. The Bible says in the book of Revelation that out of his mouth goes a two-edged sword, you know, which is basically he destroys the Antichrist with his presence and with his word. And that happens. Now, what happens, and there's a lot of stuff, again, not on here. Uh, we're talking about in the tribulation period, what happens and what's going on there. In the millennial reign where Christ sits on the throne in Jerusalem, where the nations recognize him as the king of kings, the president of all presidents, the Lord of lords, and they go up to worship Jesus. But at the end of the millennium, there's things like the devil being loose for a short season. That's all some future sermons. And then on in, ultimately, to eternal life that we're already enjoying in our presence in our heart right now. We'll fully enjoy it once in these glorified bodies we get at the rapture of the Lord Jesus. Amen? Amen. So that kind of just gives you a brief overview. And we'll be talking about a lot of these things over the next few weeks as we deal with this topic. But, <clears throat> I, I, you know, uh, this is a message. I think I looked at my preaching. Uh, I keep a catalog of everything I preach and when I preach it. Maybe eight years ago, I preached out of this particular passage on the, in the Strong Delusion. 
and just looking at it from a real honest standpoint of where we were at, I had a bunch of charts, I remember, in this sermon. We talked about what was popularly going on in the culture, what people believe now, what they don't believe now. And a lot of that's just radically changed because what we're seeing here is a greater influence of what I'm going to call and what the scripture, depends what translation you read it from, but in verse 11 or 12, it says that God sends this influence. And King James, King James' version 2, AV, they all call it a strong delusion. It might be called in your translation an evil influence. But it says that God does something and he sends this strong delusion. Perhaps you've thought before, you know, that Antichrist, he has a lot of global influence. How is it that so many people, I just, don't, I just can't see so many people being deceived, that they just volunteer, oh, yeah, I'll take one of those marks, you know. Give me one. Don't, don't leave me out, you know. I don't want to, you know. How, how's that going to happen? How, how are people going to be so foolish enough to believe what the Bible calls the man of sin? But they will. And the Bible says because God's going to do something, that God's going to, he's going to, intervene in what's happening these in, in times in a very unique way. Now, there are certain times in history as we look through the catalog of our history books and we see certain unique seasons where God just so sovereignly, supernaturally intervened, you just can't miss. I mean, the uh, creation, obviously, the exodus of the children of Israel, uh, where all these miracles take place, Mount Sinai, uh, on later, in the birth of the Lord Jesus Christ, man, God just steps right into time and eternity, and man, Jesus is born, and uh, the resurrection, and the next big event for God's supernatural intervention in the affairs of mankind is the coming of the Lord. But it pre pre precedes it by these events, the wars, the famous pestilence, and in the midst of all this chaos, which is taking place already in the world, the formation of the nation of Israel, all that's just supernatural, you know? So in the context of all that God says, I'm going to do something even further that's going to cause people to believe the lie of the Antichrist. That's the passage we read a while ago. And he says, I'm going to send them a strong delusion, some kind of strange, frightening, misleading thing that causes people to believe the lie of the Antichrist. I mean, when you think about it, the world's pretty much, the stage has already been set for something like this. Verse 11 again, for this cause God shall send them strong delusion that they should believe a lie. In other words, now I know that doesn't sound like God to some of you because God is love. God is sweet, you know. Hey, God is also God. He's, he's the God of righteousness, all right? And everything that's not righteous and just and equitable by the standard of God is going to be dealt with. All right? It's going to be taken care of. God's going to clean house, basically. All right? So God's going to deal in these end times with this kind of judgment. And this delusion is not coming to people who are really seeking him at all. Now, we'll talk about that a little bit later, too. But it says those who just, they chose to believe a lie. And they're just going to be sucked down even deeper and to believe it. The, the stage is set. Is it not? I mean, we've seen God do so much already. Prophetically, those things have been fulfilled. The famines, the wars, the pestilence, the earthquakes. Like in no other time in history, the establishment of the nation of Israel, complete miracle, no way possible. Against all odds, supernaturally, the nation is, is, is there today. No other nation's ever done that in history, ever. All right? But there it is, just like the fig tree budding, as Jesus said it would in Matthew 24. But then here comes this event. Now, all this stage is being set. People are looking for answers. Nowhere in, in probably in the history of the globe have so many people been able to relate, communicate, talk to each other. I mean, we don't have to use horses to get the message to the next village, all right? We, we have television, we have radio, we have satellites. The message that people want heard is heard by whoever wants to hear whatever they want to hear. And especially in these end times, we'll talk about how that's been affected by the influences of deception and delusion. But, I mean, we got a one-world system. we got a one-world system of electronic fund transfers. So monetarily we're set up. There really language is no issue or barrier anymore. Uh, it's just one-world like one court systems are, are being established. Uh, countries around the world are doing everything they can to destroy what we call borders, you know. Uh, we even have even politicians and people and influencers in our own culture who are pushing for the globalization of mankind. But it all, it all just plays right in. To this this interesting character at the end of time called the Antichrist. And basically, it's the same old battle that's been going on since time began, all right? God on one side, Jesus, the Holy Spirit, the devil and his minions on the other side. And the end of time, the second coming of Jesus, deals with that once and for all. And that's dealt with. 
But how many people are going to be deceived and believe the lies that the culture has, has told them? It's going to happen because this. Catch the way it's written here. It says, God will send them a strong delusion. This word send is interesting. It's, it's a word that has to do with like something on an errand. In the Greek language, it's used of something on a, on a temporary errand. All right? Just for a short while, this is going to happen. Right before the Antichrist, this is going to happen. Well, people are already being deluded, but it's going to, this is going to be a powerful delusion that takes place. So, and, it's, and it's just this moment of time. It's used, the same word is used uniquely in the book of Revelation when God tells the angels to thrust in their whatever it is in that moment. So God's doing something. He's using these angels to his message. I believe in the strong delusion, he'll use those fallen angels to create that greater delusion in people's life. So you see that there's, there's this thing that God's doing. It says very clearly, God will do this. And it calls it a strong delusion. Strong is that word in Scripture in the Greek language, energia, which we get our word energy from. It's just this effectual, operational thing that God, God allows the devil to do and to effect changes. And it's ultimately, it's a very energized, spiritually energized delusion, meaning something that's deceiving, something that's fraudulent. Something that it strays away from what is orthodoxy to that which is completely in error. It means to create in people's minds a wandering. They are literally led astray. You know, they kind of there's a passage that talks about how people wander hither and thither, to and fro. But it's in the context of our minds, and it's a mental straying, and it's something that God, strange I believe, frightening it should be. This occurrence, this misleading influence allows people's minds to be darkened. In fact, darkened so much so that they believe a lie. <laughs> but not only do they believe a lie, they commit to that lie radically. Now, whenever you look around in the culture today, can't you see the start of that happening? When people have never been so committed to lies as they are today, no matter what the truth is, just ignore it. This is the truth. When I was looking up this word and just... You know, even I preach this before I continue to study and dig because there's so much more to dig out of this passage. I, I have in my, I have a Logos uh, study uh, uh, library online, but uh, there's a Greek authority there, Jameson Fawcett, who wrote about this many years ago when he wrote of the strong delusion. He said, this refers to a powerful working of error, answering to the energizing working of Satan. He said the same expression as, is applied to the Holy Ghost operation in believers when it talks about the powerful or effectual energizing work of the Holy Spirit in a Christian's life in Ephesians chapter 1 where Paul's praying for the church that they'd be filled. Basically he said, I want you to be just energized by the Holy Spirit. And what happens when you're energized by the Holy Spirit, it's effective. It does something. It brings joy, life, strength, hope, you know, uh, boldness, courage. That's, that's, that's the Holy Spirit, how he works in us. He said there's going to be this strange delusion, this strong delusion, which is going to be on the other side of the spectrum of evil, that people are energized literally to do that which is ungodly. I personally believe, and I think a lot of people, even who do not know the Lord, believe that there's something really weird going on in the world today. There's something strange going on in the world. I mean, how many people you talk to every day and, and they just shake their head and say, oh, man, people go nuts. <laughs> Anybody even said that recently? People People are going nuts. People are crazy. I mean, you would agree. People are going nuts. Amen. The world, the culture, the society. But this is all part and parcel of how Jesus described the end times, what the world would be like towards the very end and the last days of the Lord Jesus Christ right before his coming. I believe we are already experiencing this delusion on some level, more so than we have in past years, but now it's really building steam. It's like it, it starts back here and it starts building up a, a, a motion. And the more it goes in motion, the greater the motion gets. And the more chaos is created in the wake of that motion. Here's the way I broke it down to you a few years ago. I kind of think it's broke, it broke down into the way this delusion works. I think it's in, so I kind of brought that back to this particular message because it's, I think it's, it's really a, a strong point to make. We are experiencing a mental, philosophical, and really even a spiritual delusion in the world right now. Not just this nation but globally. Starts here. How many realize, have taken time to realize that, I mean, most of us realize we go through temptation. Anybody been tempted? Yeah. I've been tempted today already, you know, and I'm in the pulpit, you know, you think you'd just leave me alone while I'm here. <laughs> just tempted. Just now, well, I shouldn't do that, shouldn't do that. But where's, where's that. But where's that start? It doesn't start at my feet. It starts in my head, in my mind. 
That's why the Bible tells us to put on the mind of Christ and learn how to think correctly. Because we don't always think correctly. But this is where the battle is. This is where Satan attacks you. In fact, just think about that thing maybe as a Christian. You say, I've been really struggling this area and this heart in my mind. You know, I just, I'm at a battle. Let's, let's simplify it might help us. Where is it starting? Right here. The devil doesn't have any power over your life but a lie. That's it. Just a lie. And what do you have to defend yourself with? Truth. So where you fail when you fail in your walk with the Lord starts right here. You know, you choose to believe a lie. Maybe you want to believe it. Maybe it's entertaining. Maybe it feels good, all right? There's pleasure in sin for a season. But you just say, oh, yeah, I'm going to give in to that. I'm going to do that. You know, you know it's not right. What's happened? You gave up back here in the mind. Therefore, it just worked out in your life. That's why we need to, to learn to think righteously, not just positively, righteously. To put on the mind of Christ, to watch over things that are lovely, pure, good report. So that we're in the middle of the struggle, we realize, hey, hey, there's a battle going on. Not just a temptation, there's a battle, and it's a battle for my life, my soul, my heart, my joy. So I'm going to make this commitment right here in my mind, first and foremost, and see how it carries out through your life. But here's the problem. Most people don't know how to think correctly. Lost people, people don't know Christ, certainly know how to think correctly. All right? The Bible says our mind is alienated from the mind of God. In other words, until we come to Christ, we really don't know how to even think about things, perceive life, and, and to have a, let's put it this way, a proper worldview. And a proper worldview for the Christian is a biblical worldview. That I believe the Bible's the Word of God. I believe it's thorough. I believe it's complete. I believe it's without error. I, I think, thank God made any mistakes in it. And I think God was gracious and, and sovereign enough to give us truth. And Jesus tells us to build our life on that truth. And if we do that, the truth will make you free. But that's not what we hear in our head. <laughs> we hear something else. It's another argument. But hey, if Satan, we talked about this when we talked about parenting and things like that and family relationships and different uh, conferences we've done. And in parenting, you have to understand that the soul and the mind of your children is at stake. That Satan is doing everything he can to steal the mind of your child. And basically get them to come up with a view of the world, a view of life that's just anti-Christ, anti-God, anti-biblical. It may sound good, and by the way, it's what everybody else is doing, but it's not a righteous perception of life. Uh, I got this recently, the Baptist Press, which is part of the Southern Baptist Convention's press and department. They, they put out this article. I thought it was fascinating. It says, it says, barely a third of all Americans believe in absolute standards of right and wrong. A third, all right? And far fewer hold a biblical worldview, the poll says. The poll was by the Barner Group. It said, showed that only 35% of Americans believe in an absolute standard of morality. That is, they believe that their right and wrong do not change with time or with circumstances. And then another guy I was listening to this week as I was working on this particular topic and studying he said he believed that if we really took time to really get Christians to be honest in the church, that probably only about 25% of average church attenders, people who are in church each week, only about 25% of them really hold a biblical worldview. The rest say they do, but the truth is measured out in our lives, in the way we live our lives. But I'm I remember when I preached this before years ago and I had some, had some Barna polls up that came up and I had these graphs, maybe you here you remember, I had these graphs about what people believed in the 60s and what they believed in the 70s and where they were in the 80s. And you just see this constant thing about where people stood on absolutes. So, well, if you're right and wrong, they just kind of drifted down and down and down. So now we're down here at like 30%, you know, one-third hold a biblical worldview. That, that, that's, that's amazing to me. What, what, what's it saying? It's saying that values don't matter. Standards don't matter. They're losing their significance. They're losing their importance in the world around us, in, in our nation. In Romans chapter 1, you, there's, there's three times where God uses this really strong language. It says, Paul says, and God turned them over to believe what they wanted, to reprobate mind. What's a reprobate? It's a mind that's separated from God. The one thing to do with God's truth. The one thing to do with the Bible. I'm just going to believe what I believe. do what I do. He says, and God just let him do that. But that's the standard of thinking today. You just come up with what you believe. You know, what do you think about it? What, you know, and, and, and you hear those little terms, well, you know, it may be right for you, but it's not necessarily wrong for me. And it, that's where we're at. 
people, they, there's no stand. Now, we as Christians, and I hope this is, you're, you're including yourself when I say the we here, we as Christians believe that we do have a standard. You know, and it's the word of God. There are things that are wrong. There are things that are right. We believe that there are ten commandments, not ten suggestions. Amen. Amen. <laughs> there are things that are right. God says, do not do this, do not do this, do not do this, do not do this. And we say, do not do that unless. Don't do this, uh, accept. Well, in every situation, no. So you have to ask yourself, do you really believe there are moral absolutes? And it really started in our educational systems back even in the 60s when it came back to this, this principle of what we called situation ethics, what we called it then, that the, your ethics depend upon your situation. But be glad, be glad, be glad that God is not like that. We have in the culture, in the world today, even in theology, what's called open theism. I've mentioned this probably a couple of times before. Open theism is a mindset today amongst the liberal theologians that says, well, God's evolving. God's growing. God understands humanity a little bit more now. He's had about 5,000 years to work with it, so, you know, he's got a grip on it now. So he's changing. You, you, you see this from Facebook influencers all the way to theologians who try to tell us when it talks about issues like adultery, immorality, homosexuality, all this stuff. You know, God, that's not what God means. God means this now. And they define what God means according to what they think God means instead of what God says he means. Listen, the Bible says about itself, it says this is not for private interpretation. What that means is you don't get to say what it says. It already says what it says. It just says it. And you can't say, well, it says it, but. There ain't no buts. All right, it just says it. It's right or it's wrong, people, but people don't see black and white anymore. It's a matter of right and wrong anymore. It's a matter of what I want to do anymore. And this passage in 2 Thessalonians indicates that this is going to get worse. I mean, it's pretty bad now. But the idea, if you look around, most people, this is the idea they live with, in our, even in our nation today. It's like, well, nobody, can, nobody has a right to tell me what's right and wrong. I decide myself what's right and wrong. Excuse me, there's, there's higher authority who's already told us what's right and wrong. His God, and God has given us his word. Well, nobody's right to tell me what to do. God does. He has the rightful place as God. And we just live with this mindset, well, there's really nothing absolute. It's all situation ethics. It's all just how I feel about it. You know, that I know what the Bible says, thou shalt not commit adultery. But <clears throat> I've been watching this TV a lot. But there's a whole lot of adultery goes on in TV, and it's always explainable, and it's always understandable because somebody doesn't really love somebody the way they really feel like they should be loved, and so they go off and find love someplace else. They're not looking for love. They're looking for lust, and there's a difference. All right? Love sacrifices. Love, love pays a price. Love gives. Love hurts when necessary. Oh, but, you know, I, they just, you know, uh, I, I, that shall not steal. Average American, 60 plus percent will say, thou shalt not steal ordinarily. In most cases, maybe somebody's not watching, maybe you steal. Maybe you deserve to steal. Yeah, they don't take care of you. How much are they paying you? You know, maybe you can, you can steal. It's okay to cheat. As long as you don't get caught, right? But this is, this is the mindset of the world. It's the mindset of, the, of students in schools, the mindset of parents on jobs, it's the mindset of people in, in the workplace. We've just forgotten ethics. We've forgotten that there are absolutes which we are all accountable to. Huh? The Bible tells us when Jesus described his coming, here's what he said. As it was in the days of Noah, so it shall be when I come again. Now, what does that mean? In, 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 right before in the days of Noah, right before the flood, and God gives Noah this instruction on what he's going to do to build the ark. It says, there's a little verse in Genesis that says, and every man did that which was right in his own sight. Pretty where, much where we are now, isn't it? Well, you know, well, that's just the way I feel about it. I don't care. I don't care. I said, what I want to do about it, that's all that matters. If it's wrong, it's wrong, but I don't care if it's wrong because this is the way I feel or this is what I need or this is what I want. This is where we've come. This is this moral Mental delusion. Now, out of that, and th out of that leads to a broader spectrum, it leads to this whole cultural, global cultural delusion, all right? When you replace absolute truth with moral relativism, which kind of now you determine what's right or wrong with situation ethics, you know, uh, <clears throat> truth no longer important. You're important. What you feel is important. What you want is important. Now, Jesus gave some really clear warnings about this, okay? To his disciples. Now, these are the 
these are the first century guys, all right? These are the guys walking with Jesus. He said, boy, if anybody is you know, going to learn the lesson, these guys are. They've got it down, and Jesus is still warning them. <laughs> you don't have it all down. You need to be aware. You need to be cautious. You need to be careful. And he gives us writings from them to us about, you know, in the last days there will be doctrines of demons that come into the church. Be careful. Don't listen to the lies. I mean, there's warning after warning to us as a church, you know, not to, to, be, to be sober, to be, to be vigilant, to be on guard, because our adversary, the devil, he's just looking for somebody to devour. And Jesus is telling those guys, even then, even though they were walking so close to him, he says, you guys need to be aware. And you need to be, you need to be understanding of the influences that are around you. He says, you beware of the leaven, he called it of the Pharisees and of the Sadducees. He said this in Matthew 16, beware of the, of the Pharisees. And he also said, beware of the leaven of Herod in Mark 8. Now, if you look in the Old Testament and Ezekiel and Leviticus and those passages, even 1 Corinthians, leaven symbolizes sin and human imperfections, human thought, human mindset, human ideas, apart and set apart from God. And Jesus is telling his disciples, you need to beware of the leaven of this influence that these Pharisees would have, and the Sadducees, and of, of even of Herod's leaven. So he's warning them against, against basically, don't take these ideas that they're giving you and try to mix it with theology or, 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 or with the Word of God. Keep the Word of God pure. Believe the truth of God's Word. You know, somebody may come and say, hey, God's changing open theism. That's not in the Word. Don't go there. Somebody may come with a convincing argument. I, I hear people all the time on Facebook, social influencers, we call them, who want to tell us what God really meant. God really didn't mean to talk about homosexuals, as one told me the other day I was watching on. God was saying that homosexuals, he wasn't talking about homosexuals today. He's talking about homosexuals back then. And there's a difference between homosexuals then and homosexuals today. Homosexuals then it was all about lust. Today, it's all about love, and God is love. That's 11. That's not truth. All right? That's not truth. All right? Love, the Bible, if you, if you ever understood what love is, the Bible says love doesn't rejoice in iniquity, and that's iniquity. All right? But, the, but so Jesus says, beware of the, now with the, with the Pharisees, what was their 11? Their 11 was to take the word of God and then mix it with their opinions and their ideas, you know, and, and, and kind of, in, enlarge what the God was saying according to their particular understanding. And then, the, then there was the, the religious traditions that they just, cl, cl, just laid on it. And then the Sadducees, the Sadducees, they were more the philosophers of, of the Jewish society. And so he's warning against that. He's warning, warning against, watch out for the traditions that men start. And watch out for the philosophy that men start, even religious. And then he says, watch out for the, the leaven of Herod, which represents the world and the culture, the world system we're living in. So he's warning them against these three influences of, the, of tradition and philosophy and society, which seem so inevitably, inevitably to work their way in and become part of the value system of Christians in any Christian community to, to such a fact. I mean, catch it. To such an extent that it's possible to be a Christian, but to live almost entirely with a pagan value system and not even perceive it. That's why while, while ago when I said I doubt that maybe only 25% of folks in our church to 30% would have a biblical world view. They say that word, but they don't understand what the biblical worldview is. They've kind of shaped it and framed it. You see it everywhere you go. You talk to people at work. Uh, you talk to people who've walked away from the church. Well, oh, the church is just a building. The church is not a building. Church is people, you know. And so I'm people, so I don't need a building. To go to. How stupid is that? You know? You're the church, and we belong together. We just happen to meet in a building. We, we could be meeting in an open field somewhere every Sunday. But we're the church, and we're the people. So if you believe the church is people, you need to get back with your people. <laughs> get with, we are the church. But see how that opinion settles in, though? Philosophy settles in. Tradition says, well, so-and-so says. This rabbi says. That pastor said. This teacher says. What does Jesus say? What does the Word teach? Let's keep to the simplicity which is found in Jesus Christ is the way the book of Colossians puts it. This, in other words, he's saying, and this, this, what I'm saying in this con, with this quote here is that it's possible even being church and said are deceived. And I see it all the time. And so do you if you're paying attention. 
People just espouse something. Sounds spiritual, not spiritual. Sounds like truth, but not truth. And it's just, it's just everywhere you go. You know? That leads to, okay, starts mentally, this philosophical mindset, non-biblical worldviews that pours into the culture. And from the culture, it definitely spreads out into what we call our moral standards, where there are no, as far as morality is concerned and decency is concerned, it's, it's extended itself in, into this moral delusion. Back to that Baptist Press article, it went on to say, interviewed about 1,000 adults in this particular article, and they said this in the article, said, listen, 32% of Americans say that morality depends on the situation and circumstances, while 33% say they do not know if morality is absolute or relative. What does that mean? All right, well, maybe, maybe, maybe God doesn't really think that really, you know, is, is adultery, is that really wrong? How about premarital sex? Let's just move it to that category. It seems we always talk about these other categories, and we forgot about premarital sex. <laughs> if God said it was wrong, guess what? It's wrong. If God said it's a sacred act between married people, then it's a, it's a place between married people, married heterosexual people. I didn't write these rules, you know, but you can be sure if anybody on Facebook takes time to listen to this sermon today or on YouTube and it gets over there, they're going to cut this off. Right? Because it... It doesn't fit with the moral, with the moral trend. It's, it's called hate speech. And that's the worst part of it because this is the message of grace and love that God's got truth for you and truth sets you free. And you can, you can have this new relationship where you are filled with the love of God and the glory of God rests upon your life. You begin to experience relationships the way God intended you to relate to the other sex and to other people on a whole new scale. And it's transformative. But we don't want transformative. We want to be stuck in our own mindset where we worship and serve the creature, as it says in Romans 1, more than the creator. So it's poured on in. There's a, there's a quote I read from Craig Vincent Mitchell. And by the way, he was at this time an instructor at Christian Ethics at Southwestern uh, Seminary. And he told the Baptist Press this. He said, the fact that only 35% of Americans believe in moral absolutes provides some frightening insight into our culture and to the future of our country. This statistic translated means, he went on to say, most people are willing to do whatever they can to get, get away with. And with so many rejecting the idea of moral absolutes, it's only a matter of time until our society will collapse. A moral society is a happier society and a more successful one. And an immoral society is one that will destroy itself and its citizenship. That's just the way it goes. Why? Because righteousness brings life and sin brings death. It's that simple. Now, for those who are old as I are, step back with me a few years. Let's get back to the 50s and 60s. 50s and 60s, whole new invasion of mindset and ideas come. Let's walk away from God, the church, the truth. It's all about free love, you know, and, and sexual revolution, by the way, which led to millions of unwanted babies, so we just kill them. Passed a law to make it illegal, by the way. We just got rid of them because they, we called them unwanted. No one unwanted in God's eyes. Which led into the 70s, 80s, 90s, the, uh, the, the rev revival of a homosexual movement, LGBTQ plus movement, all that just kind of came in on the, the, the hill. But you see, it, it is progressive like that. And then we see now the, the, the pandemic of pedophilia and all, the, all that's going on with our children and how many other people now raising their voice that it should be legitimized. But this, this is, again, it, just, it doesn't get better and better. It can only get worse and worse. And that's exactly where we're headed. And that's exactly what's happened to us. Sin, when it's not dealt with, it's unrepentant of, it just leads to deception. Even in the life of a Christian, it just leads you to more open deception. So if you hold on to something, the longer you hold on to it, the more deceived you're going to become. And it just brings darkness and it's death. I mean, if you think about morality being relative, or more, just think about for a moment, logic, God, that's lost as well, amen. The logic of, of this idea that, that God is open to new ideas and moving away from the old standards of open theism. If we, if we follow that route, whoa, what does that do to the Bible in complete? I mean, what part of the Bible do we believe? Or are any of the promises true anymore? Has God changed his mind on those? Has God changed his mind on being loved to us? And maybe, maybe he just said he's not going to honor what Jesus did anymore for, for lost people. Maybe we're all going to die and go to hell. If, I mean, that's what it opens the door to. But the Word of God is sure. It's confirmed by him. The Holy Spirit confirms it. The prophets of old, Jesus confirmed it. So we have a something which we build our life on. But the culture, you, you can't build your life and your home and your marriage on shifting sand. Your life deteriorates. And Christians, I warn you, 
And I, you say, if it's not effective, well, 10 years ago, these seats were full. You tell me this isn't working in the Christian life, Christian world, Christian community. People that aren't interested in God, they're not interested in the Bible, they're not interested in prayer, they're not interested in souls, they don't care. They're consumed with their life and they're trying to get God to bless that, favor me, bless me, give me. They quote scriptures, they place them in social media about all that God's doing while they're sitting in a drunken stupor doing it. We're just experiencing delusion on so many, and it's costing us, oh, because it pours into our homes, and it becomes a, a domestic delusion. It affects our family and our lives. I mean, the whole LGBTQ movement, uh, as well as fornication, as well as adultery, premar all that is an assault upon the home. I mean, if the government wants to say, okay, we recognize the union between two gay people, let them go ahead and do it. Just don't call it marriage. That's a biblical term. Between a man and a woman. All right. If you want to get the only reason is, if you want to get their tax breaks and their status with Social Security and Medicare on later, you all that's fine. Go do that. But don't be stealing our words. It's kind of like our rainbow. I'd like it back too. <laughs> Amen. It belongs to us. And it's not a, it's not it's not a promise of liberated sex. It's a promise of justice will be carried out and we will survive it as children of God. But where are we? And it's hurt us in our homes. It's hurt us with our kids. It's hurt us in our families. Suicide is on an up rate like it's never been before in our culture because of these, this chaos. People don't know who they are. They don't know what they are. They don't know if they're boys. They don't know if they're girls. They, don't, they want to change pronouns. Again, it's, it's chaos that's produced out of darkness. And so I, no wonder people are questioning. No wonder people have, don't have answers because if there's no truth, then there's nothing but chaos left. It's tragic where we're standing today. And I'm not a hater. I am a truth teller. Our church is not filled with it. We're filled with people who love people. Come to the table. Jesus is Lord. He offers forgiveness. He offers life. He offers hope. Come to Christ. But what is happening in the culture today is not only do we not, we don't want to hear it, we want to shut it up if it's truth. We want to shut it down. We want to cancel it, put our thumbs down on whatever the Facebook page is, dislike and decease, and shut it down. Let me close this up. A couple quick points here. On the surface, it's being fueled by a deluded media and deluded culture. I mean, you're just looking around us, and you see all this going on in, in the cultural world, entertainment world, even music industry. Everything's been infiltrated by this by this context of this. So nothing's wrong anymore. Do what you want. Revel in your, in your, in your, in your sin. This is, this is where we're at, all right? Let's have a parade, you know? And, and the, the Bible forecasts this. The Bible prophesies this over and over, and people just ignore it. But it's fueled by these things that are happening to us. And this is where Christians, this is where, guys, we have to be so aware as to these warnings that God gives us in Scripture about the things that we open our minds up to, what we watch on TV, what we let stream into our homes, what we go to the movie house to view. You know? You say, well, I'm, I'm, I'm mature enough to filter it out. Well, how's your spiritual life today? How's your walk with God? How's your prayer life? Anybody, how many people tell me about Jesus this week? You know? How's your church attending? How's your giving? It affects us on so many different unseen levels. But that's the surface battle. Just It's a constant media frenzy to promote the lie. And God says in the end times, that's what it'll be. But then he says, I'm going to make it worse. Oh, <laughs> but I'm going to take you guys out when I do it. But aren't we seeing this, this, this strange mix? Because behind it all is that unseen, below the surface, what is happening. There's this demonic invasion, this demonic delusion. Satan's always been the master of deceit. He's always been the, the, the father of lies. He's, he's always been the one who wants to steal and to kill and destroy. That's his goal. That's his aim. And he's working full time, 24-7, around the clock to, to deceive us. In verse 7, if you have your Bible, it talks about the mystery of iniquity is already at work. It may say the mystery of lawlessness in your Bible. You ever wonder what the mystery of lawlessness is or the mystery of iniquity? It has to do with us. It's not a mystery to us. We understand that sin deceives people. 
all right? The world doesn't know what's going on. They can't make heads or tails of the confusion, the chaos of the day. But we know what's going on. We understand this mystery, all right? Just as we understand the mystery of godliness now. That's Jesus coming in and saving us, setting us free. Our eyes have been opened, the Bible tells us. We can see now. We know light from darkness. So underneath is this mystery of lawlessness. And this is tied into the way the Antichrist will make his men move in, in the end times. So you have this mystery of lawlessness. Where, what, what does that mean? Well, there's a meaning to this phrase, all right? It comes from a Greek root word. Literally, it means the silent initiation is already at work. The silent initiation. And it is. It's becoming more vocal and verbal every day. The devil is just silently working, recruiting people into his little dark kingdom. So that, so much so that when the Antichrist comes to power, people are going to buy in real quick. They're going to stand in line, and if you don't, they're going to tell on you. And they're going to have you killed. That's how serious it's going to be. They're going to have you beheaded in public. There's no tolerance for you haters. Those of you who won't fall in line and do what the society's doing and the culture's doing, this is the way we want to go. That's why the Bible tells anybody gets saved during this particular tribulation because they, they trusted the Lord and it cost them their life. Silent nation. That's powerful, isn't it? Because that's exactly what's happening all the time. They can go, oh, you kind of, hey, jump, join the club. Get on board. Everybody else is doing it. Everybody in school is doing it. Everybody in the workplace. Hollywood loves it. Government okayed it. The mystery of wickedness is already at work. It's already taking place. Paul's just talking about this. It's a secret initiation into the cult of the Antichrist. The subtle demonic influence taking place in his own day, he was starting to say it. We certainly see it even more today as millions are daily being brainwashed, just believing the delusion that's all around them so that the man of sin that talks about it just easily moves right into power. Well, not me, Pastor Joe. Here's a big clue. It may be, you might be, that when somebody brings up some biblical standard and you respond like this, say, oh, well, I don't think really. What does the Bible say about it, though? All right, what does God say about it? Well, if he says that about it, then that's where I'm going with it. Because the tragedy of being deceived is you don't know you're deceived. So somebody turns the lights on. And praise God, he has a way of turning the lights on with us. All right, I lied. I got one more passage to share with you. You have to open your Bible with me, though. But I think this is a great passage to conclude with in Psalms 50. So if you've got your phone or your Bible, whatever, flip it open, get it open, Psalms 50. Absolute faster for some of you, I know. <laughs> but in Psalms 50, this is a, this is a verse. There are verses in this one I'm going to read to you that a lot of people quote. Even some Facebook influencers, they like to quote these things about God, but they don't want anything to do with the life of Jesus, right? And so in Psalms 50, I'm going to just read 14 through 23 and see if it doesn't sound kind of where we're at in the culture. The Lord says this, verse 14, Offer to God a sacrifice of thanksgiving. Perform your vows to the Most High. Call upon me in the day with trouble. I'll deliver you. You will glorify me. That's a hallelujah there, amen? But most people don't put in verse 16. But to the wicked, God says, What right have you to recite my statutes and take my covenant on your lips? You hate discipline. You cast my words behind you. If you see a thief, you're pleased with him. You keep company with adulterers. You give your mouth free reign of evil and your tongue frames deceit. You sit and you speak against your own brother. You slander your own mother's son. These things you have done, I've been silent. You thought I was one like yourself, but now I rebuke you and I lay the charge before you. Mark this. You who forget God, lest I tear you apart and there be none to deliver. The one who offers thanksgiving as his sacrifice glorifies me. To the one who orders his way rightly, I will show the salvation of the Lord. What's the Lord saying? He's saying, get in line with the truth. Learn how to worship me. Worship comes from the heart. He said, now the heart comes thanksgiving. We're, we're living in such an ungrateful society. We have a thanksgiving day. For the Christians, it should be thanksgiving every day. We just give thanks. That's worship. What happens when we start giving thanks? I start realizing how little I am and how great and big he is. When I'm giving thanks, I'm realizing, hey, None of this is because of me. It's all because of him. Every good and perfect gift God you gave me. And when I start complaining, how unholy is that really in life? If I complain about Kathy, she's complaining about me. You're complaining about that. They're complaining about this. We're complaining about you. You complain. 
how about we just back up for a moment and say, you know, I think I need to order my way differently, rightly. The right way, what's God, how does God really want to, what's the path he wants me to walk here? It starts with just having a humble heart of thanksgiving. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, God. Thank you for saving me. Thank you for giving me life. And this is what keeps you, when you do stand and preach truth, which is hard for a lot of people, you can do it in love because you're humble. You can do it because you really care about people who are caught in the deception of sin. You want to see them liberated. You're not just there to hammer your gavel and, gavel and put them in their place. You're saying, hey, this is what the Bible says. Come to be free in Jesus Christ. You can be saved. You can be liberated. You can have freedom in your life. You can have the power in your life to do what you've never been able to do before. So what is that? To do what's right. <laughs> to do what's righteous and to order your way rightly according to the will of God. I pray today that we just have a mindset of just doing what we know to do. And that really just boils down to what Jesus' last command was, you know, that we love God with all our heart, mind, soul, body, and strength. We just, we just give it over to him, you know. So what, when, when's, gonna, when's the delusion happen in the last day? What's going to happen? People are going to be deceived. Who's it going to happen to? Those who receive not the truth nor believe the truth. I'll go back to that one more time. I don't want you to miss that. Who's going to believe it? Well, it's locked up on me back there. Who believed it? Who, who's deleted? Those who don't receive the truth and those who do not believe the truth. This, though, is what we can do. We have to commit to keep our heart tuned to the Lord, just to love God. It's so easy to just drift. It's so easy just to get our eyes off him and set on ourselves again. It's so easy to be so, you know, this is the way I want it, this way it has to be, this is what, you know, and it's my world. That's not a biblical worldview. You know, it's God's world. And I can set my heart in such a place where I can let God guide me, free me, forgive me, deliver me. But after you, bottom line, how do you stay in love with Jesus? How do you keep your marriage right? Stay in love with your spouse. <laughs> how do you keep your relationship right with the Lord? Just love God, heart, mind, soul, body, strength. That's what protects us when we're loving God with our mind from the delusion that enters our mind. Amen. Would you stand with me? Father, thank you for truth. And Lord, so often we're, we, we want to deliberate it or discuss it or think about it some more when really you've just said what you've said and we just need to say yes, sir, and follow you. We'd have hearts that are tender. Lord, it's so easy, even in my own life, to just get so filled with opinion that I just completely miss you. So let that leaven of tradition or the leaven of philosophy or the leaven of what people think or the leaven of the world infect my life and my walk. I pray you'd speak to us, keep us safe within the realm of your grace, secure us in your word, keep lighting that lamp before us as we take each step with you. With our heads bowed just for a moment, I want to give an invitation today. The Bible makes it clear that all those who come to the Lord Confess him as the Lord and Savior. Believe that Jesus has died and raised from the dead on their behalf to forgive them their sins. That they could be saved. That you can have a brand new life. If you've never trusted the Lord Jesus, accepted him into your life, made a commitment of your heart to him, do that today. That's where it all starts. I love you, Jesus. Thank you for dying for me. Thank you for taking my sin upon yourself. So I don't have to be deceived any longer. Come in my heart and give me the power to live for you today. He'll do that. Christians, I'd encourage you today, if you've seen yourself moving in those kind of realms we talk about of self-deception, the leaven coming, coming into our life, opinionated versus really what does the Lord want. Ask the Lord your God just to forgive you for that. If you want to come to the altar this morning and pray, I'll give you time to do that. If you want to just come to the altar with somebody and pray, if you want to just come to Gary or myself and hey, we'll pray with you. If you want to confess Jesus as Lord, we'll pray with you. But let's not be hard-hearted. God spoke to you. Have a humble spirit, a teachable heart. Let God speak to your heart and do what he desires to do in your life. God is in this room today to work. Let's don't shut him out. Open your heart to him. Someone you need to pray for, pray with you, come as well. We'll lift you up to the Lord. But as we worship the Lord, sing this song of praise and worship. You come, let's be open to the Lord Jesus.
press against the praise into your sanctuary while we're standing face to face I look upon your countenance I see the fullness of your grace I can only bow down and say you're awesome in this place mighty As I come into your presence, past the gaze of praise, into your sanctuary, when we're standing face to face, I look upon your countenance to see the fullness of your grace. I can only bow down and say. Awesome in this place, mighty God. You're awesome in this place, Father, Father. You're worthy of our praise. To you our lives we raise. You're awesome in this place, mighty God. Worship the Lord. You are awesome in this place. Ah, the Father. You are worthy of all praise. To you our lives we raise. You are awesome in this place. Mighty God. Hallelujah. Somebody say amen. Father, we love you. You are awesome. But not only in this place, you're awesome in our lives. And we thank you for the grace, the mercy you continue to show for us. God, prepare our hearts for these days we're in. Help us to understand, Lord, what's required in our walk with you. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. You may be seated. I shared with the congregation at Magnolia this morning that we need to realize that this day and age that we're living in, if we're going to be successful in our walk with Jesus, we're going to have to learn to live as warriors. There's more resistance now to the Christian faith and the Christian person than there's ever been. Not just here, but around the world. And so we're going to have to have that warrior's attitude of boldness and courage. And that comes from the Holy Spirit who 
energia, energizes us. Hallelujah. So let's pray for each other that way. Pray for ourselves that way. Brother Gary, you come. Amen. So this morning we started our lift group, new lift groups uh, curriculum. It's the way of the master. There, man, Mr. Mike, how many do you have in there? About 20, 22, something like that. And so praise God for that uh, with this new way of the master. It's, it's really an evangelistic study. And so if you want to know more about that, see us after church. Unfortunately, at this time, we do not have an evening lift. Um, and so be praying for that as well, that God will just lift up a, a leader to uh facilitate our evening lift, but we do have our morning lift, and so um, it's full, uh, but that we've always got more room, amen, and we'll find a place uh, for you, and and so be praying for that as well, and be praying that God, again, not just for this moment for leaders, but that God will just lift up leaders in our church, uh, because it's not just lift that's suffering, it, it's all of our ministries, and so uh, that leads me to, actually, well, before I get to the next point, let me put this in there. We have our evening activities, uh, Youth and Awanas at 515 tonight. Uh, and so for our youth and Awanas, uh, our kids, they'll be meeting here at the church tonight at 515. But to go back to my earlier point, this Wednesday we're having our our leader, campus leadership meeting. It's at 630. And so if you are in ministry, a leader in ministry, you're a volunteer, or you want to know more about being in uh, leadership or volunteer in the ministry, uh, this meeting is for you. And so it starts at 630. We're going to have a light dinner. Um, and so Angela Este, I want to thank you and the ladies that are going to be providing those, those the, the, the meal for that day. Uh, but it's an opportunity for us just to share the vision uh, of what 2023 is going to look like with Believers Fellowship. It's about uh, what God has called this church to do and who to be. And, and, and so you do not want to miss this. If you are a leader again or you just want to know more about how to get involved, because we're all called to be leaders in the body of Christ. And so if you want to be uh, more, if you want to learn more about that, and that's not just adults, uh, youth and, and, and children, if you want to know more, come in, come on. Uh, if you are breathing and you belong to Believers Fellowship, you are you should be in ministry. And, and so come and be a part of that. Again, that's from 630. Uh, we'll probably enter about 745, 8 o'clock. But elders, deacons, uh, awanas, nursery, all areas of ministry, uh, this is a meeting for us, again, to vision cast and really talk about what God is going to do, uh, is, is doing, and, and, and where we're going in 2023. Uh, don't forget to stay connected with us on Facebook, YouTube, and bfchurch.com. For our, don't forget your godly giving, three ways to give, online, in person. You can drop a check off uh, Monday through Thursday at the, at the church. Now, this is the last Sunday to give for our Christmas offering. And, man, this has been a blessing. God has really moved at both campuses. You can see the number up there, 29905. Amen. Let's give the, the Lord a praise on that. We had our elder meeting, and, and those funds are already uh, I'm going to use a term that they use in Congress, earmarked, right? And, and so those funds are earmarked for mission trips, uh, but also for ministry. And, and so God has really blessed the opportunity to share the word. And so be it Belize or Cuba or local, God is going, God has given us an opportunity and a platform to share God's word, to share his word. And so thank you for those that, that gave. Uh, and again, today is the last day to give to that mission offering. And so those are the numbers behind me. Uh, again, thank you for everybody that, that gave in that. Also with that, don't forget to give to our, our um, food pantry. That's always, that's year round, right, Mr. Jimmy? You're around, amen. With that being said, you are dismissed. Thank mm -hmm. you.